Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Monday Thursday service for April 17th, 2014. Tonight, Pastor Bob Hiller brings us a message entitled, Unless I Wash You, based on John chapter 13, verse 1 through 17, and 31 to 35. Let's listen in. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Our text this evening will be taken from the reading in the Gospel of John. Let's begin tonight with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have sent your son Jesus to serve us by giving us his very body and blood to eat this, this night in the sacrament. We pray, Lord, that as we hear of the mandate he gives to us to love one another just as he has loved us, that you would strengthen us and empower us with your spirit uh, to carry out your will faithfully in this world. Be with us now and open our ears and our hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the more manly shows uh, that I like to watch on television is a show now, now ladies, I don't know if you will like this one, but I'm sorry. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a show called Downton Abbey. Anyone seen the show Downton Abbey? Uh, it's, Glenn knows what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a... <laughs> It's a show for men, uh, but Downton Abbey is a, is a British soap opera, it's so it's maybe not the manliest show, but it's an interesting show, and actually I've gotten caught up in it, and though the fourth season was abysmal, uh, it's been a pretty interesting show to watch. If you don't know how the show works, it, it's, it's kind of like this. It, it's a show about an abbey in Downton, and the abbey is this huge house. It's almost kind of like a castle in this place, and the show revolves around the people who live in the castle, both the lords and the ladies of the house, as well as the servants who live downstairs, and, and the lords and the ladies are upstairs, and the servants are downstairs, and what's really fascinating to watch is the way they kind of navigate through life. There are very clear distinctions in roles in this house. In fact, we would say there are class distinctions. The Lord and ladies live upstairs, and they are served by the servants. And the servants live downstairs, and they serve the lords and ladies. And they never leave the basement unless they're given permission unless they're allowed to go upstairs, unless they're going to work, unless they're requested. And the lords and ladies never come downstairs to be among the servants unless they have a request or they're mad. It's just very interesting in the way things work. And then when you look downstairs, it's, it's fascinating because even downstairs, there's sort of rankings. You have the head butler and you have footmen who are pretty low on the totem pole, I guess, and you have bakers and you have waiters and waitresses. I mean, it's just, it's really an interesting way to live life. And they don't even seem to have a problem with it. I mean, we democratically minded Americans, we watch that and we go, it's just not fair. It's just not right. But they say, yeah, this is just the way things go. It's very interesting. But I mean, what, what, what you'll notice is that people rarely break rank on the show. The lords and ladies never come downstairs to become servants. You never see the servants sitting at the table for dinner. They're just not welcome. It's just not what they're supposed to do. I mean, can you, can you even imagine the, the, the dowager? The, uh, what, what do you call her? I'm going to say it wrong. The dowager, Lady Grantham. Can you even imagine her cooking with the women in the kitchen? It's laughable. No one watches the show? Okay. Um, <laughs> ladies, you should really watch this show. It's pretty good. Uh, anyhow, you just wouldn't expect that to happen. The lords don't serve the servants, and the servants certainly aren't served by the Lord. In fact, it would be shameful to see something like that take place. It would have been laughable and, in fact, embarrassing to the family and to that society to see such a thing happen. So with this kind of mentality, we can kind of understand St. Peter tonight, can't we? As Jesus gets down on his hands and knees to wash Peter's feet, Peter is thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. we're breaking rank here. This isn't the way things are supposed to be. You're the Lord. We should be washing your feet. You should not be washing our feet. This is completely backwards. Now, you've got to understand, the washing of the feet was about the lowest job in society at the time. The lowest of the servants washed the feet. Let me explain this to you in as polite terms as I possibly can. In the first century Jer uh, Jerusalem, in that area, you would walk around on streets that were dirt all the time. So your feet just got filthy because you only wore sandals. And so you're always walking around in the dirt and you're also sharing the street uh, with the cows and with the donkeys and with whatever else people are riding. And that stuff's getting all over your feet. And so then when you go to someone's house for dinner, they would have a servant there. And that servant's job, the lowest servant's job, was to wash the cow pies in the mud off of your feet. It was, not a, it was not a good job. It was not one people signed up for. It was the lowest of all the jobs. You see, nobody wanted that job. 
And so when Jesus gets down on the floor to wash feet, Peter and the other apostles beside him kind of start to get very uncomfortable. Uh, Peter's actually right, according to the custom of the day, to be upset by this. No, Jesus, you are not going to wash my feet. Who does this? What kind of Lord washes the feet of his servants, especially a guest in the house? I mean, that's the guy. That's the main guest. He should be doing the service. It would be like inviting a celebrity over and saying, okay, now here's a tray. Start serving people, you know. Uh, that's just not going to happen. That's the person you want to exalt. That's the person you want to serve. And yet, there he is serving others. Now, now what is Jesus doing here? What kind of a Lord tends to his servants? What kind of Lord does the servants work? Well, Jesus, I guess we could say, that kind of Lord. And this is what life is like under the lordship of Jesus. He is a Lord who serves us even before we can begin to think about serving him. He comes to us and he serves us and he washes us and he cleanses us. Listen to the dialogue. I love the dialogue between Peter uh, and Jesus tonight. Jesus came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? It's probably better read this way. Lord, you're going to wash my feet? No. No, that is, no, that is gross. Get up, Jesus. That's what you want to read going on there. <laughs> Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing, but, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Now here's, this is the best part. Jesus answers, unless I wash you, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. This is like your boss coming to you saying, I, I like having you here in the company. I like working with you, but you got to understand if you're going to keep your job here, you have to let me give you three more weeks of paid vacation and a raise. <laughs> like if you want to keep your job, you'd better let that happen. And that's that's going to kind of wreck the company. That's just bonkers, right? And yet Jesus, <laughs> it's, it's what he does. Under my reign, Jesus says, I wash you. I serve you. I must give myself for you before you even begin to think about serving me. See, brothers and sisters, this is just the sort of Lord Jesus is for us. He's a Lord who comes down the stairs to where we live. It, it, in this relationship we have with God, it's not about us. It's not like a job interview where God is checking us out saying, all right, I want them, I want them, I want them. They have all the right credentials. That's who I want in here. No, it's the other way around. Jesus comes down to us and he finds us and he seeks us out with filthy feet and filthy hearts and sinful intentions. And he finds us in our sin covered in muck and shame and he walks down the stairs and he gets down on his hands and feet and he starts washing us. He starts cleansing us. He declares us righteous. He cleans us with his very own blood. He comes down to us. It's not about us proving ourselves and performing and making it in his kingdom, proving that we have some kind of worth here. No, it's about Jesus coming to us and making us worthy, telling us, I love you. So you are worthy. It's his service to us that makes us worthy, not our service to him. But see now, now we get our hands on that and we think, oh, now this is great. All right, Jesus, since now you're serving me, I've got a list. <laughs> now that this has sort of come up, I've got a number of things I think you ought to do. I've got some good ideas for what this relationship can kind of look like. And we kind of forget that though he is serving us in love and mercy, he's still our Lord and he's still the one in charge. The conversation between Peter and Jesus goes on. Jesus has washed his feet, says, you have no part with me unless I wash you. And then Peter says, well, then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus, just, uh, Jesus answers, Peter, stop talking. That's not in the text. <laughs> I added that. Jesus answers, a person who, is at, who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. I'm not here to give you a bath, Peter. His whole body is clean. And then this word that he says to Peter and to the apostles and to you and to me tonight. And you are clean though not every one of you. And there he's, he's referring specifically to Judas, who's about to betray him. He, he knows it. But to you and to me and the apostles tonight, Jesus says, but you are clean. See, see Peter says, all right, well, if it takes you washing my feet to have me follow you, then I'm going to be the most invested follower there is. So wash my head, wash my hands, just wash all of me. And Jesus says, Peter, stop. Look, I'm serving you, but I'm still your Lord. And I'm going to serve you and I'm going to love you, but I'm going to do it on my terms, not yours. I'm going to do it in my way, not your way. 
I will serve you and I will love you in ways you don't expect nor even desire. I'm not here to give you a bath. I'm here to show you who I am. That I am your Lord who serves you. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to bleed for you. I'm going to cleanse you and wash you with my blood. See, if Jesus was going to do things Peter's way, we would never have salvation. We would never have hope. Remember that one conversation Jesus and Peter had that one day? Uh, Jesus says to the disciples, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And I'm going to rise. And Peter stands up in front of Jesus and says, let it never be, Lord, just like tonight. You can't wash my feet. You can't go to the cross. And Jesus says to, to Peter lovingly, with, with a smile on his face, I'm sure, get behind me, Satan. I'm going to do things the way the Father wants me to do things. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to rise for you. It might not be the way you planned it. It might not be your kind of kingdom, but it's the very thing I'm going to serve you with. If we were going to do things Peter's way, or probably more applicable here, our way, the kingdom would be set up according to power, according to might. Things would go my way, and if anybody tried to get in my way, I would crush them. I would lord myself over other people. I would gain advantage over others. I would look out for myself. But Jesus won't have that in his kingdom. That's not the way things work in his house. Instead, he comes and washes the filth off of us. He calls us to do the same for one another. He goes on. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asks? You call me teacher and Lord, and and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I've set an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. We don't live here in this household of God with the intention of lording ourselves over other people. We don't live in the household of God trying to gain advantage for ourselves. Our Lord himself doesn't even do that. No, he serves us. He comes down to us so that we might be exalted in his household. And then he calls us to humble ourselves so that others might be exalted. Even if it causes us shame, even if it makes us look bad in the eyes of the world, even if we have to suffer We are called in every calling we have in this life to serve, to be last so that others might be first, become weak so that others might become strong, just as Christ has done for us. This applies to your your family, with your spouse, with your kids, with your parents. This applies to where you work, with your bosses and co-workers. This applies to your church, the people you are sitting next to right now that you worship with, that you receive the sacrament with. We come up here and Jesus serves us with his his very body and his very blood and unites us together. And and the love that is given is the love that spreads between us. It's one of the beautiful things we do here is when we hold hands after we receive the sacrament because we're being reminded of what's actually happening in that moment. Christ is uniting us together and calling us to serve each other and and love one another. In in the household of God, we have a, a Lord who comes down to us to serve us in grace and humility and calls us to do the same for one another. Because of him, we have a seat at the table. Because of him, we get to come up here and and hold hands and receive his body and blood because he has decided to serve us. We're in the house. One of the great storylines in Downton Abbey. Now, just real quickly, this is a spoiler alert, okay? Uh, if you're watching the show, if you're not halfway through the second season, I'm really going to ruin this for you. And <laughs> sorry. Um, don't worry, I could ruin it more, but I won't. Uh, but, but one of the great storylines is, is a love story. <laughs> I'm going to talk about football tomorrow night, I think. Uh, there's a love story in, in this uh, between Sybil, who's one of the daughters, one of the ladies of the house, and she falls in love. She doesn't really like the class distinctions. She doesn't like how this works. So there's a love story between her and the driver. Now, it's, it's early 20th century England, okay? They're very aristocratic. They like, the, they like the queen. They like the king. They like all that business. And this Irishman is the driver, and, you know, he's a, he's, he's a, he's a socialist. Oh, look out for that. Uh, so, so there's nothing right about this guy, but she falls for him. She falls in love with him and they get married. And suddenly now, because she broke rank and went down and started dating the driver, you know, he's a part of the family. 
he's brought in. And they run off to Ireland together and it causes all kind of shame and havoc in the house and all of this. But she gets pregnant. And so they return. And now they're trying to figure out what to do with Tom. Tom is the, Tom is the, the, the ex-driver, now part of the family. And they're trying to figure out what to do with him. How do, we, how do we treat this guy? We're not sure to handle it, how to handle it. And then suddenly tragedy strikes. And I'm going to ruin it for you. Sybil dies. Sybil dies because of a contract dispute with the writers. But that's another story. Uh, but, <laughs> but Sybil dies in the show, you know. Uh, and so suddenly you're like, oh, man, what do we do with Tom? Well, Tom's now got, you know, the child, and, and we've got to care for the child. But what do we do with the Tom? Well, well, because of this, what happens is the driver now gets a seat at the table. Because Sybil died, the servant now becomes an heir. And he starts serving the house in a different way. He starts making decisions for the community. He starts to involve himself with the way, uh, the goings-on of the Downton area. Suddenly now he's serving in a completely new way. And all the while, he's being served and cared for and loved by the family. Because she died, he now has a seat at the table. See, I'm sorry if I spoiled it, but the illustration is too great because this is exactly what Christ has done for you. And Christ has come down for you. The Bible calls us the bride of Christ, right? Christ comes down and he loves us. We who are, who are on the outside, the sinners, the dirty, the filthy ones, he comes out to us and he, he loves us. And he takes us to himself and he gives us a seat at the table when he dies for us. Because of his death, we come here and we, we come around this altar. <laughs> and we also know the end of the story. He also rises. That's, that's the surprise on Sunday. I hope I didn't spoil that for you. Uh, but he rises again. <laughs> and when he rises, he promises to continue to come to us. And he gives us here. He serves us when we come up here. He gives us his body to eat. He gives us his blood to drink. And he unites us because of his death. We have a seat at the table. We're a part of the household. We're in the family. And we now have brothers and sisters who need us and who we need in return. That's what it means to have Christ as our Lord. A Lord who serves us and teaches us to serve and love one another. When Christ comes to us in this meal, when he came to us in this meal tonight, he forgave our sins. He washed our feet. He washed us clean and called us to go and love and serve just as he has served us. May it be so for us according to his will. Amen. We pray. Father, we thank you for the mercy you have had upon us. We thank you that because of your son's death, we get to come to this table. We get to be served by him. We get to receive the forgiveness of sins and the promise of everlasting life and bread and wine, which are his body and blood. We pray tonight that as we prepare for tomorrow evening to think about his crucifixion, to anticipate his resurrection on Sunday, Lord, that you would unite us together in love and you would teach us to serve in love just as he has loved and served us. May our hearts and our faith always be focused on Jesus and may our hands be busy serving the people around us so that your name would be glorified in all things, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For more information on Faith Lutheran Church of Moore Park, California, and for more podcast episodes like this one, visit us on the web at www.faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.